and round trip and electricity storage. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as I was already introduced, I'll be talking about a new energy storage concept called fire brick resistant seated energy storage, or we'll just be calling it fires from now on, um, and how it can help decarbonize the industrial heating sector as well as uh, store electricity to provide backup storage for the grid for intermittent renewables and nuclear power plants. So the theme of the conference, obviously, is to decarbonize our energy sectors. I don't need to tell anybody here that energy storage remains a large obstacle in decarbonization. If we're going to have a lot of intermittent generators like wind and solar, we need abundant, affordable energy storage. Nuclear reactors also don't usually like to load follow. And when they do, it's uh, less economically advantageous. So everybody benefits from storage. The problem is that no deployable, affordable energy storage technology exists. Um, batteries are very deployable, but they typically cost a few hundred dollars per kilowatt hour, um, with the best projections usually being around $100. Um, pumped hydro is our best storage option, but it's site limited and mostly exhausted. And compressed air storage is usually a slightly worse version of pumped hydro. Uh, some people might take issue with that, but it's, they're similar, but they're both site dependent. Um, so right now, as we implement more renewable energy, curtailment of those options uh, is the most common um, choice uh, whenever they produce too much electricity in, in, in the grid. So we're not installing enough energy storage, even as we uh, rapidly deploy renewables. So we need an alternative that's both affordable and deployable. Um, meanwhile, if we look at the actual energy Sankey diagram, we'll find that we need 30 quads of zero carbon heat still to actually decarbonize. Um, so the US uses about 100 quads in a year. A quad, this is a quadrillion BTU, or one exajoule, if that means anything to you. Just know that we use 100, so about 30 more quads of heat is 30% of all our energy that we're consuming. Uh, this is our electricity. This is all that goes into producing the electricity. We're only producing about 13 quads of electricity a year. So even if you decarbonize the electricity sector as it is, there's still 30 quads of 30 energy right now that goes into powering our industries. So we have curtailment in the electricity sector where we're, we're shutting off renewables as we deploy more because we can't store it. Meanwhile, we need lots of energy here that's heat rather than electricity. So if we could have a technology that could transfer energy from here to here, that would be a huge advantage uh, to take advantage in the meantime of those renewables that we're, we're adding. So, so our concept is fiber resistance heat energy storage, or FIRES. Uh, and it is a heat storage concept where essentially you charge with electricity um, a mass of fire brick by heating it to very hard, high temperatures, anywhere from 1,000 to 1,700 Celsius. You would use commercially available bricks that are already commonplace in industry, alumina, magnesia, or silicon carbide refractories. Um, and you can use metallic heaters or alternative heating options. And we have large brick masses today that are used to recover heat from from the off gas of different industrial processes. So you can imagine installing heaters in these systems. Uh, to get the energy back out, you just blow air through air channels through the brick, and you produce hot air that can be used to run whatever industrial process you want, or you could put it with a power cycle for electricity production. Um, it's affordable and deployable because brick is cheap, heaters are fairly cheap, and um, you can find prices now for small systems that do this at around $15 per kilowatt hour. Um, this is actually a punchline from later, I guess. So I'm going to explain to you why I think we can do the, the industrial scale at $10. But you can buy small ones now for $15. And recall that batteries are much more expensive. We can co-locate with any heat user. Um, this is one option of what I'm calling ETES, electrically heated thermal energy storage. So TESS is a big field thermal energy storage. Um, I think there's a whole class of technologies you can have that are electrically heated that should be much more utilized in the future um, as we deploy more renewable energy and more nuclear energy. Um, because excess electricity can do a lot when converted to heat. And hopefully I'll make that case today. I keep hitting the wrong arrow. So as I said before, the process is pretty simple. You'll have a large mass of brick. You'll use low value surplus electricity to charge it when it's uh, not in demand. Then when you want the energy out, 
you run cold air through, it comes out hot, and it goes to whatever industrial kiln, furnace, or power cycle you want. Uh, the brick will be hotter than whatever you're trying to uh, give heat to. So if it's too hot, you just bypass some of the air that would normally go through and mix it to whatever temperature you need. As the brick cools in time, you'll just run more and more air through and mix less bypassed air to maintain your temperature in time. Um, so if you wanted to, you could add it to a power cycle after the compression step. So if you were to compress in this natural gas plant, run it through the fire system, provide your heat instead of natural gas, and then go to the turbine to produce electricity. That would be an efficiency of 55 to 60%, the efficiency of the plant itself. And when this starts to cool, you can inject your natural gas as normal. Or you could install it in future nuclear air Brayton power cycles for um, Gen 4 nuclear plants. This could also be a configuration for concentrated solar power plants, where basically you would compress your air, add some heat from your, uh, your zero carbon heat source, then in times of peak demand, add your fire's heat on top. And the efficiency of this configuration is nearly 70%. And now we're approaching pumped hydro efficiencies, but we're installing it at any power plant we want. So essentially, you can get 60 to 70% efficiencies at any power plant you want. It's like giving them the capacity of pumped hydro. And this is the main appeal of this technology. Um, looking where else it could be used, let's dig a little bit into the breakdown of the industrial heating sector and all the spots that could benefit from, well, that, spots that need to be decarbonized that we can use uh, fires for. Um, so there's about, I told you before, well, there's 24 or 25 or so quads of heat in, the, in this industrial block. Um, here they're calling it 30 for this breakdown because they're back calculating the electricity component and figuring out the energy that went into that. So they're calling this 30 quads. And we're breaking down about 24 here. And what we see is that um, we're going to break it down into cold and hot, uh, low temperature and high temperature things that are around 500 C or less, or things that are 1,000 to 2,000 C. And what we find first off that's interesting, just as a side note, is that the biggest industrial requirement actually is petroleum refining. So in a zero carbon world, we're going to be doing a lot less of that. So that's an interesting find, is that almost a quarter of our energy goes into that. Um, but other things we have is lots of chemical processing, forest products, food and beverage. These are some of the biggest energy users we have, and they're all very low temperature, actually, 500 C or less, usually a couple hundred C. Um, so for that, you could very easily use uh, commercial heaters that are available today. Um, and it's not that different than the residential scale system that I showed you earlier. Um, then you have higher temperature things, things like iron, steel, aluminum, glass making. These things are going to require uh, higher temperatures. And if we add to it, this isn't part of the breakdown here, but if we just add the other applications, we can couple the steam power plants or gas power plants, like the power cycles I showed earlier, and we sort of form a high temperature and low temperature regime for the fire systems we could be developing. Um, so let's look at what the fire system would actually be made out of um, and the characteristics of those materials. So alumina, magnesium, silicon carbide are sort of the, the go-to materials in the industry for high temperature applications. They mostly exceed applications uh, temperatures for any of the things we just pointed out. They're all 2000 C plus, uh, and their cost is only about $2 per kilowatt hour, if you assume about 1,000 degrees Celsius change, and an energy density of one megawatt hour per cubic meter. So this is one megawatt hour. If you want to store a gigawatt hour of energy, a power plant for one hour, then just 10 meter by 10 meter by 10 meter block of brick would get you that energy. And that's what grid scale energy storage looks like. Um, as far as the heaters go, uh, we're going to sort of talk about metallic heaters and ceramic heaters. Metallic heaters are cheaper, lower temperature. They're hitting around 12 to 1400 C at their peaks. Um, they're customizable to any length, so we can easily span a large brick mass, say that uh, 10 meter cube I just talked about. Um, but they need to be supported against gravity. So if you were running vertical channels, you couldn't really string them along the channels. You'd want to run them between the bricks that are being stacked up. Or you could run your whole thing horizontally and run it along the channels that way. And we think that's the optimal way to install metallic heaters. Ceramic heaters, higher temperature, bit higher cost. They have to be cantilevered to walls. And they can be about two meters wide. So it's a bit harder to span that large brick mass. Um, you have to work with the geometries more. but 
The punchline is that low temperature heaters, we have a lot of faith in, can span these brick masses. Ceramic higher temperature applications are a bit trickier. And also for all the heaters, you notice that the peak heater temperatures are less than the brick temperatures. So we're really limited by the heater, not the brick. Um, and the ceramics can hit about 16 to 1800 Celsius. So that's what we have to work with when working with commercially available materials. But what are the capabilities of this technology? A key question might be, for a variety of temperatures, geometries, discharge rates, whatever we want to do in that big industrial sector space of, of what they need, how well can we reliably discharge heat without having to use that fossil fuel backup? In a zero carbon world, you won't want to have any backup. So we simulated that using Craig-Nicholson finite difference. We discretized the walls of the channel and discretized the height of the channel. And we took time steps of air flowing through with heat transfer going in. And at every time step after the heat went in, we stepped that up. And that's how we got the temperature profile throughout the system throughout the time um, with a bunch of parameters. But it basically, temperature in minus temperature out gives you the heat that you transferred. And essentially, whenever it was too cold on the outlet, we would simply speed up the air to increase the m dot. And by increasing the m dot, as your delta t goes down, you can maintain a constant discharge rate. So whenever the discharge rate was less than what we wanted, we increased the flow rate. However, if this temperature ever dropped below what the application wanted, say you wanted 500 C air, and you dropped down to 499, now you can't run any more mass through, or else you're not delivering the right temperature. So then you just stop driving more air through, and when the power dropped down to about a factor of eight, we just stopped the simulation. Um, and so the parameters that went in were storage capacity of the system, the discharge power of the system, the height to diameter ratio of a cylindrical uh, air channel system, peak temperature, operating temperature of, of what we're delivering heat to, and how big this, these square air channel cells were, and also the fraction of brick versus the fraction of air. Those are the main parameters of interest. And the performance results that we care about are how long can we constantly discharge, how much energy can we constantly discharge at the rate that we want, and what's our fan power requirements for blowing the air, and what's the thermal shock across the wall, the temperature difference across the wall. So here's a base case results of how the system looks as it runs. This is temperature versus time. This system starts out around 1200 C and uh, is a 250 megawatt hour system, so pretty good industrial size for uh, suitable for a lot of those uh, industrial applications that we mentioned. Discharging at around 50 megawatts, so it take about five hours to discharge. We see that the air temperature gradually drops in time, as you'd expect, as the brick gets colder. Um, but despite the fact the temperature is dropping, the discharge rate is maintaining constant at 50. That's because we are constantly ramping up our fan power, ramping up our, blow, uh, our blower, until a key point where we hit the 500 C demand. That's what our demand is here. And below that, we don't run any more air through, so our fan power starts to drop off due to uh, the temperatures. And the power also drops off. So what we found was in this particular system, we can get about 67% of our energy out um, at this constant flat rate. In other words, the integral underneath here. And the rest of the other 33% is there. Um, fan power capped out at around 2%, 1.6% of versus the actual, as a percentage of the power that we're getting out of heat. And the temperature difference was around 155C, which the brick can withstand a few hundred C is what we generally found. So that's all fine. Um, but then we varied all, all these parameters that we put in, all of these, to start seeing what else we can do. Um, so in particular, there's a lot to cover here, but I'll, I'll give you the punchlines. Um, we checked out two different peak temperatures, say metallic heater that can go up to 1200C, or ceramic heaters that can go to 1550C. Um, to see the relative benefits. And basically, you could imagine that, well, I'll go back real quick. If you wanted to, if, if you kept out your, your operating temperature at, say, 800C, then you could imagine that your integral would basically cap out at this time period instead, so that you'd be over here. So if you just stepped back every step of this, I can tell you how much energy you would have gotten out at, at the constant rate you wanted for the given temperature. So what this is, is a plot of how much energy you get out at the constant rate versus the operating temperature. So for a 1200C system, if you want a 1200C heat out, it's basically zero because you can't get 1200C forever. But as you want lower and lower temperatures, you can get more and more of your energy out at that temperature. Um, 
And what we find is for those lower temperature um, applications, say the things that want 500C, um, if you went to metallic or ceramic, they both have energies between 0.6 and 0.9 uh, for both. So basically, the ceramic, the higher temperature, didn't really help you at all in terms of your heat transfer. So you're better off just going with metallic because the ceramics are more expensive. Um, another thing we varied was the, the channel dimensions. What we found was if we had a smaller channel dimension, we dramatically improved the heat transfer. So we dramatically improved the rate at which we could get, or the amount of energy we can get out at a constant rate. So now we're getting almost 90% of our energy out at constant rate. Very little need for fossil fuel backup. So definitely want smaller channels. And let's say instead of discharging for five hours, we want to discharge all of the energy in, in 10 hours, or maybe only two and a half hours. That's the spread of these uh, dotted lines. Um, you see that basically trying to get energy out faster results in a bit less uh, energy out at a constant rate. So you can do it, but it takes a penalty of that. And also your fan power goes way up. This is your fan power percentage. Uh, if you have um, faster discharge, it goes up by, by the cube of that because that's how flow rate and fan power works. Um, so those are punchlines of design. I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to move on and move on to some punchlines. This is a high pressure system. It basically shows that at high pressure, um, we can get similar great performance, almost 0.9 energy out. Uh, at constant rate with low fan power requirements. Um, and so this is like characteristic of a system that would get you 66% round trip efficiency. We're basically acting like a battery now or a pumped hydro station. Um, other key findings, can we charge quickly? Yes. We can install enough heaters and we could charge in anywhere from three to four hours or less. Um, sorry, or more. We think that's a high, a high charge rate. You probably wouldn't need that for daily cycling. Um, and you can improve that factor if you, um, you can improve the performance of your heaters if you run them at lower temperatures, um, make them last longer. Those are questions to answer later. Heat leakage, can we insulate it well? Yes. Standard numbers, 2 to 3% loss per day. So you can store for a week or more. Um, is it affordable? Yes. Uh, broke down the costs. Um, and basically found it's around the 10 or $11 I quoted earlier per kilowatt hour. Um, if we made it any smaller than the 250 system I, I said, then this, this will get worse. If we make it bigger, it gets better. The economies of scale are very beneficial. And it's still much cheaper than batteries. A um, couple notes here are if we couple it with power cycles, um, a lot of the cost, we have brick, insulation, transformer, and blower, and vessel, and the heater wire. The transformer is actually the single biggest cost, the, the additions to get the energy in. So in the power cycle applications, there's already a transformer. So we could actually cut down on cost considerably and perhaps even break this uh, price limit. Um, early market case, we just checked the economics um, in a uh, northwestern Iowa market where there's a lot of renewable energy and where there's expensive natural gas. So if you were to run this system and basically charge it whenever natural gas was more expensive than electricity, we found that you could pay this thing off in under two years, just because of the arbitrage that you're, you're doing. That just shows that there's markets now that could benefit from this, and industries that could benefit from it now in high renewable penetration areas. Um, so in summary, it can charge and discharge, charge and discharge comfortably in multi-day cycles. It can store energy with minimal losses. It can be co-located with almost any industrial application upstream of their normal fossil fuel burner. It can be built from existing uh, ceramics, heaters, and other equipment and it can offer an affordable pathway for round-trip electricity storage. Um, challenges are we need to do specific case studies to make sure that it works with specific applications, specific industrial plants. Um, and the biggest limitation is the heaters, which is the subject of my PhD right now, working on electrically conductive, electrically conductive ceramics. And with that, I'd love to open up to any questions and thank my sponsors at the INL, and at Exelon Corporation. Thanks. We have time for one quick question. Make sure I have a question. Sure. Yes. So since uh, you are using the heat uh, as a final usage of the energy, then how is the price compared to just using the gas, the natural gas to burn 
whatever they are you want to do rather than having the storage option. So you're saying just burn the gas instead of? Um, so it depends on the market conditions. Um, obviously, normally, using electricity as heat is not as good as just burning something as far as price goes. Um, so, but in some cases where there's a lot of solar or wind right now, that energy, the price is dropping a lot because it's not in demand. So that arbitrage case I said shows where in some areas it's cheaper to do, but in lot, most areas it's not. But if you want to decarbonize, of course, fuel isn't an option anymore. So if we install enough solar panels everywhere, then it can become cheap, uh, as well as winded nuclear. Thank you. So the last speaker, but not the 